Good morning. How's everybody doing? I know you were not expecting to see my face. You only see it for a second. If you are tuning in for the first time, my name is Laura Boquin and I am the Community Arts and Engagement Coordinator at the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts. Hey, Sunny. Hi, friends. So this morning we have George Taylor with us. Hey, Melissa. And um, I thought since this, we just had Thanksgiving on Thursday, I thought that it would be fun to keep it kind of close to home. So I am um, featuring today on Local Artists Live my friend and neighbor, George Taylor. And I'm not going to say too much. I'm going to flip it over to him. So it's true to Local Artists Live. Um, and maybe he'll give us a little bit of some background about himself and himself as an artist. Um, and then we'll look at some of his work. Uh, please feel free to ask questions. George is happy to answer questions. So if you'll type them in the comments, I will relay them to him. I hope everybody's having a great Saturday morning. And let's see, let's flip the camera. There's George. Good morning, George. Good morning. <laughs> All right, George, tell us who you are. What do you do? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm George Taylor. I'm a professional artist and have been for about 32 years now. Um, I paint for a living. I do, I'm represented here in Montgomery by Stonehenge Gallery, as most of you probably know. I do festivals and I'm increasingly doing more of them uh, around Alabama and now I'm starting to get outside of Alabama and the adjoining states and uh, it seems to be working for me, he said, knock on wood. <laughs> uh, so um, yeah, but it's also allowed me, um, you know, as you all know, Montgomery is a very traditional town and, and the tastes of the people who buy art tend to be pretty traditional, which is how I came up. But as you get older, you get bored and you start going, and you see all these other artists at these festivals doing this far out stuff and you're going, look how much fun they're having. Why can't I have fun like that? And uh, it's just always a mystery to me because I come back here and try something a little bit weird and they don't buy it. So I can't do it, not for a living, which is what I do for a living. So um, what I did was uh, doing these festivals, suddenly you're accessing a market that has more varied tastes. And my gosh, you do something really far out and they buy it. And I was like, oh my God, this is gonna be cool. So anyway, that's one side of my odyssey into cubism, and the other part is just the fundamental dissatisfaction with my work. I, I'm an art history nut. I study art books all the time, go to museums when I can, online, um, and I, I just, my work wasn't good enough. It's not as good as the stuff I admire from all the masters of all the different ages. Uh, and now we're competing against TV, computers, movies, Everybody's eyes are so jaded. How can you make them say, wow, you know, that's not easy anymore. It's, it's almost impossible. So my thing was to say, well, what if I, I still love my rural Alabama subject matter, unfortunately, because not everybody wants that on their wall, it says I'm country. Uh, so how can I make it sophisticated enough where it covers that base? It says I'm country and I'm sophisticated and urbane and all the other, you know, uh, virtues of that sort. So anyway, that's kind of what I've been cooking up for the last seven years, and I'm not nearly there yet, but um, I'm making progress, I think, uh, but it's a heck of a lot of fun. And by the way, I'm continuing to paint a great deal of realism, realist impressionist type stuff to, to eat, and I, I still enjoy doing it. If they make me Picasso for doing that, I'd probably just stick with it, but they won't apparently. <laughs> so, uh, darn it. So anyway, uh, I thought over here? I'd show you kind of a, a these are the paintings I have that haven't sold. So some of the better examples have sold. Um, but this was a, a realist impressionist piece that I did probably five years ago. And I've, I'm happy with a lot of it, and I'm also dissatisfied. It's like I've seen this, you know, this is Pissarro, this is Monet, this is, you know, all these people I admire so much. And when they do it, it's wonderful. And when I do it, it's just like, yeah, you know, I finally learned the technique and it's like, but I'm just not, I'm just not as talented for one thing. But um, anyway, that's what's led me on this odyssey. Uh, so this is, this is a decent example of, of what I do and did, especially. Um, this is down on 331, just at Snowden, just south of Snowden. 
This is the sales arrow in front of the fireworks stand, if any of you know that area. <laughs> uh, but it had a, a forlorn self-pitying quality, and this was right about Valentine's Day, so... <laughs> Okay, more more pity party. <laughs> don't don't ever. Yeah, don't. Yeah. So, uh, and this is a broken heart, not some other organ that other people suggested. Um, but anyway, uh, what else? I, I was happy with a lot of the aspects of it, but again, it's just not enough. It didn't like you go. Oh, I can't stop looking, which is what I want. I want to trap you all in my paintings forever. <laughs> Uh, get the so. evil cackle again <laughs> <laughs> so anyway um so there we are so that's example one um, well, before you take it off the easel though george i love i mean i remember this one for our, from art talk the the way you captured the rest on here i mean it's well, thank you it really is beautiful well thank you. you you might want to try stepping back i don't know if it's possible with the phone whether yeah, it will it. give but the, the strength of this piece is the spatial effect right. from seeing from 20 feet all right Get so much light. I was talking to Laura just before we started filming that I think maybe it's the frame is, is part of the problem because there's not enough dark in there to emphasize the, the amount of space I've tried to condense within the picture. But um, so, you know, I, I don't have a decorative gene. I can't frame my own work. I've learned to take it to the framer and walk away because that's what they're good at and I am definitely not good at it. Um, so. Um, All right, let's see the next piece. Yeah. Very nice, George. Right. And anybody who's just tuned in, I'll say again that if you have any questions for George, um, he will be happy to answer them. I will relay them to him. We'll look at the empty easel. <laughs> Take that metaphorically. Well, that's the piece I got in the Venice Biennale with. The <laughs> empty easel Thank you to everybody who's joining. I guess I'll show this one, although it's somewhat out of sequence. I've always had kind of a knack with cubism. I like playing with it. And um, so I, one February, I was so frustrated. I just said, I'm gonna go sit out in the backyard, it's freezing. And I was like, I'm gonna experiment in a really comfortable place where nobody's watching and see if I can't figure out something new to do. And I came up with this and I didn't finish it because I didn't know how to finish it, still don't. But it may seem slightly familiar, certainly to Laura and I, um, but <laughs> if you just look, basically it was filmed about 10 feet behind me. I mean, it was not filmed, painted. Paint. Uh, one, of those, <laughs> one of those. You know, that only gets you so far, and God knows it's been done by better people than me. Um, what I wanted was to make the picture interesting and yet still relay the, the crucial information in a more or less representational way. Um, and the question is how you do that, and art history is a, basically a big story about that. And But none of the answers are perfect. There is no one. system that seems to work satisfy me anyway so I decided what about doing like a pastiche you know just use whatever seems to work best for a certain object do that and and uh, take the uh, the honest of having to have one uniform system because that was kind of a reflection of the post-impressionist thinking but the thinking of that time you look at the philosophy they were all trying all the philosophers of that 1880s 1890s were trying to find one system that encompassed the whole world and they could not, uh, finally, and they created a lot of mischief by doing so. So I thought, hey, cafeteria style, you know, if impressionism works on this air conditioner, okay. If, if you know, expressionism <laughs> works on this tree, okay. Um, that's kind of what I'm allowing myself. Um, so anyway, but I'd be what? curious to let Laura photograph the scene. I wish we could hold up the painting. What angle do you want me to stand at? Well, I'm right? sitting right over here. Okay, show me. So I'm trying to think, so I guess you would have to get it there. Okay. And I could get here, and perhaps I can get, the easel wasn't in the picture, by the right. way. All right, so you see, we've got the water hose back here on the wall. Obviously I see the bricks. 
in the neighbor's house. The windows. Yeah, that's really cool, George. Oh, thanks. Very nice. All right. Let's see your next one. Right. Let's see what's coming up. Sometimes when you think about a thing long enough, uh, this happens for me, and I, I, when you're longing to do something different, suddenly it crystallizes and you get lucky. And that was the case with this one. I did not know what the heck I was doing, and I tried <laughs> to combine about 15 different stages of analytical cubism in one painting, which was way too many. But I can't stop looking at it even to this day. Yeah. Um, and that's the great virtue of it. Uh, I was like, now this, this is, I'm still giving you the information, but I'm just playing with it. And it allows me essentially compositional training wheels. You, with cubism, mm -hmm. you got a problem, you just solve it. Uh, you know, you don't have to be, all the planes don't have to completely connect with each other as they do in reality. At least as it appears to us, who knows? Uh, <laughs> sorry, no moral relativism this early in the morning. Uh, but, <laughs> Not enough coffee yet, George. Yeah, well, let me get some more. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, there's also a face that appears in that railroad sign at about 30 feet. Oh. Um, so I don't know. I tell people at festivals, and I learned this over time, but I've heard it from various, once you learn something and you go back and find everybody knew it and you thought you had discovered something. Uh, but I do that with Clark Walker's work all the time, sure. by the way. Uh, but anyway, a good painting, I think, should be really good up close. It should be interesting, okay, have yeah. great metier, or, you know, surfaces and textures. Uh, then at six feet, it should be somewhat different mm -hmm. and a different painting in a way. Okay. And then at 20 to 30 feet or across a big room, uh, say a museum where they're doing your retrospective, for instance. Um, <laughs> Like MoMA, you know, I'm not trying to pressure you. Um, <laughs> you know, it should also be something entirely different and yet, you know, still have great virtue. Uh, a Monet, for instance, if you've seen one in a museum, when you get back 20, 30 feet, suddenly it looks like you're looking out a window. Right. Uh, I mean, truly, the space is just amazing. Yeah. You just can't believe it. Like that. Um, so anyway, um, I really didn't finish it that much. This was in August, I think. And of course, the heat contributed to some of my uh, fracture. Uh, sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I really didn't know what, what to do with it beyond this point. I had so many disparate elements of or stages of analytical cubism in there that it somewhat lacks unity that doesn't really bother me so much uh but i was making some of the railroad things really big here mm -hmm. you know and then also having them at the, at the you know also relate to the landscape and the natural size right i don't know how well that works uh that's a problem especially spatially suddenly you're but i like that i want that you know it was like the one with the house here with the bricks I wanted the pattern of the bricks. I know that's like a realist, you know, 1640s Dutch, get every little brick, but right. I want that, you know? So uh, this fracture thing allows me to take one plane and possibly blow a thing up or emphasize an abstract quality of it. And But if you have the contrast with a, a grounding element that's presented representationally or mm -hmm. realistically, uh, I think it's much more tolerable to normal people. And I'm ultimately painting, trying to paint for everyone. But I, I think Shakespeare had it right that you have to have something for the, the most sophisticated, you know, audience, but also for the groundlings, you know, because the groundlings are who buy the work, you know, right. largely. At, right. at, you know. So, anyway. I think what really works in this one, George, um, I mean, a lot of it works, but <laughs> the, the rolling hills mm -hmm. um, kind of contrasting with the like the geometrical straightness of the or what would be a geometrical straightness of the of the railroad right. those angles that's really lovely well, thank you you're welcome yeah, yeah i was doing a lot of scraping back techniques at that time okay. which are really uh, I love them. You know, a lot of the great colorists like those, but Pierre Bonnard especially, who was kind of the last great impressionist realist mm -hmm. representational painter in my mind. He died in 48, and I think that's where the footprints go into the sea, and we don't 
you don't know where art's going, at least in a representational way after that, with the exception of a handful of painters. Uh, I mean, there's plenty of great ones out there now, don't get me wrong, but um, people who are doing something truly new in the modernist spirit in that right. chain of inquiry, I don't see much of that. So. We'll see what's next. Yeah, no, no recording of this Odyssey would be complete. <laughs> so I tried to do one in the studio from memory and imagination. And uh, it's a disaster in a lot of ways, and yet it's very good in a lot of ways. Mm, yeah. I just stare at it sometimes and go, what the heck was I thinking, and how can I get back there? <laughs> uh, I was trying a lot of the Cubist language on. Okay. I was still still trapped in that analytical Cubist language. The beauty of it is, is that Cezanne pointed the way to all that Cubist stuff, and he actually came up with a number of the major devices that they used. Um, but, of course, he died and never got beyond a certain point, nor was he, he was of his time and didn't feel the freedom that Rock and Picasso later had. Um, so those, those, those situations and problems still occur if you're painting landscape representationally. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, what if you took the tools developed and refined by Brock and Picasso and then plugged them back into those situations? Now you, it's the difference between having a hand screwdriver and one of these super guns that poof, poof, like you see the roofers right. use. You know, it's just a whole other world. I have yet to be able to employ them anywhere near the way I think it's possible to employ them. Uh, so I'm still, you know, it's logging hours out there in the heat or the cold and going crazy on your own and <laughs> seeing what you come up with. But it's a heck of a lot of fun, I will say that. Uh, where where did you paint this one? I basically in my studio, as you can okay, see the lack so, of color. So you were going from memory, you said yeah. that, yeah. I got distracted looking. Yeah, Clark Walker once said to me, I, I was looking at a painting of daylilies, and I said, you know, so did you paint these from life? He said, you know, I've been painting them for about 30 years, and you get to a point where you kind of know what a thing looks like. <laughs> and I have to <laughs> confess that sometimes, uh, you know, and Hopper said this, he, he gradually began painting more and more from memory and imagination. I find the temptation, but I still love being grounded in a fact yeah. and then abstracting from it. Uh, but I have found that I can fake things, and, you know, it's not terrible. Um, but uh, Bonard said the same thing. At least he had to have a sketch from reality before he could do one of his confections but right. um, anyway so I was just there's a bunch of these but this is one of the more interesting of them cool just kind of wrestling in the dark and I feel like maybe you've uh, seen enough and painted enough uh, hay bales or cotton that you yeah. you may know how it goes guilty as charged <laughs> okay let's see let's see what else like I say so I'm just showing you examples that I have. Yeah. I never thought this stuff would sell, uh, but I would show it occasionally just to get more respect for my fellow artists who thought representational work was primitive uh, and that I was just country Joe. And I am country Joe, don't get me wrong, but I like <laughs> to think I'm more sophisticated than just ain't that pretty, you know? Yeah. Although ultimately that is my impulse. I think that's every artist's impulse. But Anyway, this is another railroad sign. I think I'm attracted to those. They have the multiple lights. It's kind of like eyes, I guess. And it's like they're, they're looking. They're always yeah. looking, looking, looking. But anyway, this was painted in June, a particularly hot day. Uh, so that's my excuse. <laughs> there are a lot of problems, lots and lots and lots and lots. But there is, there is some virtue here and there. Um, I really wish I'd emphasize the cars more. There's two cars here. Okay. This is a you know railroad crossing. Of course. Yeah. And one of the temptations when you do an experimental work, which I didn't know because I had not done much experimental work, is that you're stumbling into this new thing, and the temptation is to stop before you screw it up. And if you if you come upon some new idea for yourself. You don't want to cover it up with the next layer of paint, and so you. I, I found myself being very timid in terms of trying to progress the thing. I, I thought is, well, I'll do another one, and that one I'll go ahead and wreck in mm -hmm. the name of making further discoveries. Uh, so in a way, it's kind of like the cowardly lion. 
lion in the Wizard of Oz, you know. It's just like, whoa, I'm going to screw it up. I'm going to lose this little <laughs> nugget I've found, you know. Uh, so that's one of the reasons this one's not developed further. Uh, hmm. But anyway, on to the, the better pieces that I have. <laughs> Since you're the same one, Laura, you should keep track of time. I don't know how I got much you. time yeah. you have or whatever. So. You're doing good. About eight more minutes. Oh, I you, better hurry. You're doing great. All right, this one is an old sharecropper shack uh, just down on 331, about halfway to Snowden. I've painted it numerous times, but not, uh, <laughs> not quite like that I didn't yeah. paint it. Um, I got really wow. into the, the language and I, of cubism but I ended up doing it completely wrong. <laughs> I know you're all surprised who know me, uh, but I found my own thing. And basically it's the idea of like a fractured lens. Um, so it's the opposite of modeling and insisting on those volumes in an object. I'm actually fracturing the perceptual field uh, in order to include more of what I want to put in the painting. Um, I didn't really realize I was doing that till long after, but. Uh, anyway, in this one, I, I got it right on some levels. There are some weaknesses. There's plenty of weaknesses, actually. But um, in terms of the movement and the fracture, the rhythm of it, I'm, I'm still very pleased with. One of the things I came up, I realized, was that these marks is what's known as a forced edge in graphic design. Okay. Where you create the idea that there's a fracture in space, you know, two different planes. Okay. Um, that I call them rents, R-E-N-T, because it's like a rent in the space-time continuum, the way I'm using it. So I'm an Aristotelian, sorry folks. <laughs> it's not very popular right now, but that's who I am. Uh, so anyway, I've kind of got a, my own language, but with the rents on this one, uh, I, I'm really happy with the movement. Interestingly, I found out, uh, you know, there's two major movement devices in graphic design. There's the arabesque, the S-curve, and then there's the zigzag, the lightning bolt, you know. Um, but that whole zigzag thing, uh, unfortunately, appeals to me more than the harmonious S-curve, yeah. although I use both. But it also ties in very much with, in, in micro with Van Gogh's brushwork in macro. Um, and I've spent two years chasing Van Gogh now, trying to figure out his system and tie it in somehow. The thing is, turns out, I thought his system was, you know, kind of childlike and playful and simple. Turns out it's the most sophisticated system I've ever tried to copy. It is unreal. It's like Mozart's music. Hmm. You can say, oh, it's just pretty and light and happy. Yeah, you go try to copy that guy. It's, <laughs> it's just impossible. Uh, so I have tremendous admiration for what he managed to accomplish. But I'm, you know, he's dead. He wouldn't mind me stealing from him. So, um, yeah. So. <laughs> Anyway, just a, a brief glimpse of this one. I had a picture that I painted, and this also is 331. There's a pattern here, I guess you can, it's a creature <laughs> of habit. Uh, and this was a picture about the transition from winter to spring, and it was like right in the middle of March. And it was, the sky was cloudy and sunny and happy. And uh, then COVID came and uh, uh, the picture didn't sell. I think the patterning, I found that at least at festivals, I, I love this. See, it's my compulsive nature. I just, ugh. but um, it doesn't sell. People don't, they want variation apparently. Mm -hmm. Or they want light impressionist suggestion. They don't want that heavy handed post impressionist rap, um, at least for me so far. Uh, but I'll make them my, my <laughs> <laughs> I'll show them. No, but anyway, uh, so I had this to play with. And so this picture is entitled Just Past the Ides of March. Hmm. Uh, but this was at the time in March of 2020 when everything was falling apart in the big cities yeah. up north and it hadn't reached us yet. And you're just like, hope it doesn't. Hmm. But I found an expressive way to use the rents. People have said that at festivals, you know, because you get talked to thousands of people. So it looks like bats. And I was like, Okay, great. That's exactly what I was after. It's like, it's, you know, a symbol of evil. It's just a different one. Hmm. Uh, so, 
anyway, I still think it has some merit. There's a lot of things I'd do differently, but hmm. you can't know till you know. Right. <laughs> And just to keep us flowing, in case anybody does have any questions, if you've tuned in more recently, um, we are welcoming questions for George as well. Yeah, that'll be level. This is yet another attempt in that line of inquiry. Um, I came off of the, and I was still really tied to the rhythm of the rents. Uh, I also tried doing what the, you know, Brock and Picasso really got into during the early part of World War I, probably 1912. Brock continued to do it. That is putting uh, sand in your gesso. Mm -hmm. And they were doing it for different reasons uh, because brushwork, there's so many people that are still copying the Impressionist masters. And they want to differentiate, uh, differentiate themselves. And this basically almost makes it impossible to do brushwork hmm. with any flair. Uh, it, it makes so much drag on your brush. So the lesson for George is don't do that again. Because <laughs> this thing was hell to paint, especially because it it's cold and it's a you know, winter afternoon, freezing. The texture is great though. Well, yeah, it's gotten, it's, yeah, you know, I'd say that. But in a way, it, it, it took away all sorts of other virtues it gotcha. might have had if I had a more free hand, yeah. you know. So, and also at a distance, I think it's important to see this one at yeah, a distance because sure. it, it kind of comes together in a way you can't see up close. I've had a lot of success with this at festivals, at, at least of being a spectacle. People have lingered in my tent, more people longer looking at Look the at stuff. That one. Uh, and I did sell a few this fall, which I'm very, you know, excited about. But most of them weren't buying it, they were just looking at it, which I guess is a form of compliment, you know. Uh, not not the one I would most <laughs> prefer, but People who are looking for a while are certainly interested, George. Yeah, I, that's one thing I've really run up against in this picture in particular. But I love all these country subjects. It's not like, I, I, but because I'm using value to do the rents, because that's the Cezanne into Brock and Picasso language, it has a negative connotation that I really, I wanted it in the COVID picture, but in mm -hmm. this one, no. But the problem was, what do you do? The, op the options as I see it are either using color whether one uniform color or different colors. Mm -hmm. You could use like an earth brown, you know, kind of a brown to black because I use color on everything else or possibly use white rents. But there aren't any great answers out there that I've figured out. Um, if anybody has any suggestions, let me know. Mm -hmm. uh, I, but, I, but actually I've begun to think this ties in with Gorky's work as well. Uh, Arshil Gorky, I guess that's how you say it. Arshil Gorky is the best of the abstract expressionists, really the first one. And I see a way to fuse this where in future I could just tie in a big blob of red here. Why not? It's my world, yeah, as, yeah, as totally. Bob Ross says, you know? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I'm crazy, man. Uh, so uh, anyway, I'm really excited about where this can go. It yeah. can go anywhere. So. When I love that one and the scale that you painted it too, George. That's... Well, thanks. As I get more confident, I'll paint it bigger and bigger, hopefully. All right. And last but not least, Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. And I have taken it further than this, but I, I wanted to humanize it. It had too many dark connotations, and that was one of the things I was trying to, because basically I like the, I love the stuff in the country. It breaks my heart. I just have to paint it. But uh, I didn't want it to be this super negative thing. So as you can see here, I've used blues uh, on the rents to try to take away some of it. But the symbolic meaning of dark colors generally is negative. So mm -hmm. it's a quandary. But... The idea was, among other things, that you can cobble together all sorts of things. For instance, some of the ones I've done, I found you could have multiple vanishing points. And mm -hmm. the cubism allows you to do that, okay. where you can tell a much broader story than the traditional picture frame limited artists to. Um, but all these things were in different places. And it was like, that's a problem I kept having doing traditional realism. It's like, okay, that's a beautiful old building, but there's nothing behind it of interest. There's nothing in the foreground of interest. How do I make a really strong painting out of this? And the answer is, well, you lie and cobble it together from different sources. So that's what I tried to do in this one. As to what it means, uh, there's some kind of vague economic theme in this. Uh, if you look at it, um, 
from one train of thought. Uh, that's a monarch butterfly, and their deal is they basically, you know, migrate up and down the planet, uh, living off of goldenrod throughout the year. So they're kind of like the jet set rich. And then you got the bees, which is like us all working ourselves to death for someone else. Uh, the, the barn and the grass, the grass grows naturally. And I, I, I've come to think of hay rolls as like almost a symbol of culture, of stored knowledge. Uh, but the, you know, you stand out in the cold and hot enough, you go crazy. Uh, but um, anyway, so but I haven't found like a unifying theme that this is good or this is bad. It's just kind of like this is. Mm -hmm. um, but so that was kind of part of the the impulse and I don't know that the frame is good with that one I just used to get this peanut butter colored stock because it kind of went with everything and didn't yeah. didn't kill anything and I couldn't afford to custom frame everything but um yeah maybe a better frame would help uh, no I, I like that frame George oh, thank you so that's kind of my spiel like I say I've gotten a little bit further with these I've let myself have the arabesque in yeah. this thing and that's that's like having a wild animal on your canvas I mean you talk about movement. It's just crazy. And, you know, Van Gogh really did that at the end of his, uh, I believe it was the Saint Remy period, into the early Auvers. Uh, and he continued to use it here and there. Uh, but, boy, it's like an engine. You just plug an engine, you know. It's the same as having electric lights on the canvas or something. It's just wah, wah, wah. Hmm. Uh, so that's a lot of fun. Uh, what could I get if I really tried? <laughs> Then I go into politics. Well, uh, well, we <laughs> we look forward to seeing how crazy you do get, George. Oh, thank you. Um, one last opportunity for questions in case anybody wants to ask George anything while we have him here. Um, but if you ever see him out painting in a field or on the side of the road, stop and say hi and he'll tell you more about all of this. A lot of people honk. Um, so it's almost a constant cacophony and they all think I recognize their particular honk and recognize <laughs> them car. from five years ago when they stopped to say hello. Uh, so forgive me if I don't say, hey, Bill, hey, John, hey, Jack, hey, Judy. You know? uh, so. Well, thank you so much for doing this, George. Oh, Anything, any parting words of wisdom for everybody? <laughs> wisdom? <laughs> don't have that. <laughs> Wish I did, though. Hmm. Uh, but well, thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Well, thank it. you. And um, we love looking at all of this and seeing your art and hearing all of your... Rap. Um, <laughs> well, no, what, what's where your brain is when you're trying to create this new style and new look and what you're pulling from. It's really interesting. So thank you, George. Well, thank you. Okay. Have a great day. Um, everybody, have a good Saturday. There I am. Hello. Have a great Saturday. Thank you for tuning in. Have a good weekend and we'll see you um, at the next.